when I was first contemplating water, one of the key things I was thinking about is how does water shape us? And then how do we shape water? that landscape to understand what it is before we enter was key to the idea of, uh, of where I ended up going. So, color, large format landscape. I mean, people were doing it, were doing it in black and white, but not in color. But after a few years of doing that, I recognized going through the windy valley with snow-capped mountains, very classic kind of uh, point of view, engineered line through that landscape meant. And then also trying to make one co contemplate what, does, what do those cars mean? What is that, you know, what that they take? Uh, that we were dwarfed by nature, that nature was the force. And now, the Industrial Revolution, 200 plus years later, in uh, the Atacama Desert, 25,000 um, employees that were working there, they were producing all the material. There's a lot of rock that has to be put somewhere. So this is in, 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 um, in Sudbury at Inco Tailings. So I did a whole series on tailings as well. And, and as, as of quarries, both in the in, uh, uh, United States, some in Canada as well, over the centuries, and, uh, and then finding, finding those voids, and then being able to record those voids in ways that kind of bring us, reconnect us with these landscapes, uh, Canada. And so we're largely urban, we're a largely urban, urban culture. And we don't see, we don't, we, we, we know we're a natural resource economy. We know that's where the landscape, with that landscape of where we take, where we go in. And to me, that was the landscape that, that interested me. And, and these are some of the latest, at one point was something that was equivalent to the skyscrapers uh, in Toronto when I first saw them when I was 17, step, you know, looking at the IMK, the CIBC building. Was the representation of that inverted architecture that that is a direct consequence of this was the largest dam ever built, and I think it will be the largest dam ever built by man. Um, and it, it had 34 turbines. These turbines are almost uh, equal. Each turbine is almost equal to a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power stations about a thousand megawatts. These were 700 megawatts per turbine. through transport, whether it's our clothing that has oil in it, through synthetics, or that's black top going up um, past Perry Sound. I was heading up to, to and, and I was looking at my, I was a Volvo, and I was looking at my steering wheel, and it was plastic, and I was looking at, you know, all my dash was plastic as well from uh, scrap yards. And so it's that kind of, um, you know, the things that, the thing that humans produce more than anything else in the world. I also went to look at uh, oil fields that had been abandoned. This is in, in Baku. These are big jets that were abandoned. These are transport jets in the U.S. military. That's oil, oil. The tire piles. They created a kind of a, an immense landscape on their own. I photographed it. It was hit by lightning. And, Tankers where they go to die. Down. And it was the quarry series that got me shooting in Italy, and it occurred to me that I could go somewhere where I don't speak the language, I can find assistance, I can navigate further and further into the world. 
to the point where my work became very global. So I've worked in India and China and, and a variety of other places. So now I'm onto the water. place where these two themes I've been working on for a long time, oil and water, kind of merged in the same surface. So this was the, this was the drilling rig that actually did drill uh, the hole, uh, the Makanda hole that went bad. Uh, and now it's currently drilling to try and build drill the relief well. This is about um, four weeks into the disaster. Uh, and to me it was kind of that same, uh, it's a kind of like the Mary Shelley Frankenstein story kind of overreach where we go into a situation. This is all around the Delta, also the Mississippi Delta, this is around New Orleans. And if you look, this is almost like a distressed landscape on a distressed landscape. So this is, the, the green is also from phosphor and nitrates coming out from the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. And the Gulf actually, there's about a 100 kilometer radius around the exiting of the water of the Mississippi. diverted for, uh, for Los Angeles, uh, and that was done by Mulholland in around 1910. And this is the remediation of that lake bed, so they're actually, it's a billion dollar irrigation project to keep the dust down on that bed. Uh, this is Salton Sea, which is another man-made disaster where uh, uh, 1905 a dam broke on the, on the Colorado River and re-diverted the whole Colorado River into the Salton Basin. Uh, and, it, and it just flowed for four years, creating... And what's happened, this is the silt, remaining silt in that delta, and what happens here is as the, as the pumping action of the ocean tide tree forms, so the whole delta is now uh, covered in these kinds of tree forms that, um, that are a, a result of, of the you know, silt and the, the, the pumping action of the tides. This is uh, just a small area where there is another river that comes into the Delta region, and there is still some life and some color in that as well, but it's almost it was abandoned in the Delta. This was, uh, um, they, they do some ocean waters and then, and then harvest the, the uh, sea salt. This is a phosphor tailings pond in Florida. Phosphor being one of the, um, you know, prime, Destroyers of water space. High phosphor coming into the water, uh, you'll get you know, what's happening in Lake Simcoe, Lake Winnipeg, even uh, Lake Erie, you end up getting. Uh, and often, the, uh, what, what would happen is all of the wetlands would absorb, and all the greenery in the wetlands would absorb that phosphor. In, uh, in um, uh, geothermal the town, in the uh, environmental reports for. Uh, uh, for the salt and sea were starting to come out in the late 70s and early 80s, the town that would be the, the water that's diverted, the 4, acre, uh, 4 million acre feet diverted uh, uh, from the Colorado, the last diversion, uh, diversion of water. Again, an image showing both before and after, like on the right, that's what you start with, a desert, and then you add water and you can get a uh, fertile um, but up against the Navajo Reservation. Different attitudes towards the landscape. Uh, there's less uh, snow cap and more demand on water, so this is the lowest it's been in, in its history. Los Angeles aqueduct kind of petering out. Uh, Holland, uh, this is where all the reclaimed land from the sea, this is part of the way they do it. It's a processing plant in, in London, England. Plant in the United States. And then I looked at also ancient controls of water. These were step wells uh, in northern Rajasthan where during the monsoons they would fill up and then throughout the year the towns would, would come and walk down the stairs as the water table went down and were able to get water throughout the year. So I did a series on these uh, crazy step wells, the, the ziggurats, that they um, allowed for the taking of water. And now they're all step wells, so now they've all gone dry. <clears throat> this is 12th century, this is built in the 12th century, like literally inverted pyramids. Uh, 14,000 kilowatts on the Yellow River. 
So that's the silt being actually released. So uh, it happens once a year. They, they blow out a lot of the silt. Uh, this is uh, greenhouses in Spain. I did a whole series on pivot irrigation. This here is, is, a, is a suburb. These are homes. Uh, and so these are about a mile across. So each one of these is about 650 acres. Uh, so, the whole down. so I went in search of the green verde uh, circle, and then this is uh, one that had to be abandoned well over 20 years ago. So I looked at areas that dry, dried up. And this is like the last remnants of a circle that was active at one point. And to me, that was the metaphor that I wanted to work towards. Is this These are all olive trees. Uh, for this, it's called dryland farming. It's a one crop a year farming uh, in central, in northern central Spain. <clears throat> and this is basically foothills, and they're basically going into the valleys and farming the the the, the um, plowable valleys within within these uh, foothills. Uh, it's been going on for quite some time. I found Spain a very rich place to photograph uh, agriculture because of the, the color palette in there. Uh, aquaculture is another large-scale human in, uh, incursion or human use of water, so um, in most of uh, most of my research ends up looking, if I'm going to do agriculture, I'll say, well, where is the greatest concentration of agriculture in the world? Well, China does the most. If you look at all the agriculture, homes are all stitched together with these little plots for, uh, for aqua farming. So uh, this was, uh, and, and in China, I'm going to show you a small video uh, of the making of this shot, but I put my 60 megapixel Hasselblad on a remote helicopter. This is um, in Yunnan province, and these are rice terraces that have been going for uh, close to 2,000 uh, some an activity that humans can engage with uh, for a long period of time, and, and, and agriculture is part of salt recovery from the oceans. And again, I, you know, I think that if you go back to the earlier landscape work, I'm still working with that all overness, with color, with uh, you know, and now with the aerial work, I'm becoming more abstract as well. Suburbs in, in Florida, uh, Cape Coral, this is one of the largest uh, uh, false uh, waterfront uh, de developments in the world. So I was interested in that kind of, um, you know, not meant to be waterfront, but that they were. This is in Spain, looking at uh, recreation as a, as a drive for humans to go to that. And then also looked in India, the largest human gathering, the largest pilgrimage gathering for the spiritual quality and, and cleansing power of water. So there's that, to, uh, to bathe in the Ganges. So this, again, the prints I'm working on here, like this is three frames stitched together in Photoshop, but blown up to eight foot wide. So Again, uh, reclaimed waterfront in Holland, uh, polders in Holland, uh, fresh water. If you look at the two million lakes beyond um, the Great Lakes, uh, that rep represents another 10% of the world's fresh water. So Canada is really a, a water nation. untouched watersheds in the world, which is the northern BC, the Stikin. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to kind of go, go and kind of tip my hat to that landscape, to that place where the hydrological cycle begins with the, you know, the fresh water comes off the oceans, gets caught into the mountaintops, as it lands in snow and then melts throughout the year and provides uh, fresh water downstream. So that's in Iceland.
again in Spain, Iceland again, glaciers, so much of our water comes from, from, from glaciers throughout the year. There's a lot of school. Festival, the largest pilgrimage of humans on the planet, uh, but their pil their pilgrimage is true. When I first started doing altered landscapes, um, it was more of an exploration, going in my car, driving around North America, searching for things. I didn't know exactly where they were or what they looked like, so it was always this kind of adventure and discovery. And what's changed over the different themes uh, and over the years is now with this and that was interesting so I it was a, very much a global approach to the idea of water with no restrictions as to where 